a lot of people talking like they politicians and choose to be an accountant because it's safe in the business. Not because they want to do it, just because they heard it pays. And who the fuck wants to be poor knowing that's how we've been raised? Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight. The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shame. And that's the reason I'm staying up late, trying to find a way to escape. The stereotypes this day and age is making me feel like the only way I'll be happy is getting signed to a label and making money through rapping. I want to share my emotion because this world is attacking the very principle of life that lets the people be happy. If you don't have a reason to breathe, why even live? These battles cause our impressions of everything that it is. created equal because some decide to be great and some decide a sequel to an average person's life is simply what they want to be so you make your decision all i know is what i'm giving won't define the life i lead or the way i dwell in existence i've seen a greater image on the walls of where i'm living and the words twisted and scripted remind me of something written faith is a gift that is given down to the people if one believes it one receives it it's given if it is needed don't ever think you're trapped in a life that you never wanted your options are infinite that's some mathematical logic i'm not saying I'm a prophet, I'm speaking for what it's worth These lyrics define my prayers and these battles cause I'm a church Not saying I'm a prophet, I'm speaking for what it's worth These lyrics define my prayers, these battles cause I'm a church Well, hello everyone, you caught me looking down <laughs> Um, how are you doing? It's good to uh, see everyone here. I got my little viewer count so I can see that. And I need to put back up the comments, don't I? Let me find them. Because I moved them off for last... When I was doing my Tucker Carlson thing, that's when I moved them off. Okay, now I've got them back on my screen. And actually, I'm trying to see if I can put them visible, all of them visible on my screen. Let's see here. Uh, add widget overlay. And it's covering me, but yeah, here we go. We'll see how this works, at least for right now. Can I make it longer? I don't think I can make it longer. Well, we'll leave it like that for right now. I'll play with that another time. Each time you can see, I am figuring it out a little bit more and more. Um, Alexander, no, it's not just you. There's other people. They're just not saying anything. They're being very quiet, which is usually what happens when we first get started. So before we get into the topic for today, so I'm not fiddling around with everything because I can do that forever. Though those of you who watched, what was it, five streams ago, I've gotten much better. you got to admit that. Now I'm a little bit more comfortable with the software. If you haven't checked it out yet, please go and check out my stream. Well, it wasn't a stream. It's a sh actually recorded. It wasn't live show on Tucker Carlson that I uploaded late last night, maybe early this morning, the day's blend together because uh, Tucker's boyfriends are bigly mad. They are bigly, bigly mad at me and they're totally ratioing the video. Not that I give a flying fig because listen, I'm a libertarian. I do things to please exactly one person on this planet, me. And if I'm happy, that's all I really care about. Um, as long as I'm not hurting anybody, correct? But Go watch it because I actually think you'll find it useful and hopefully productive. And if you share it and just to irritate Tucker's boyfriends, if you want to give it a like to keep it from being ratioed, that would be cool. Again, it's not for me because I really don't care. I find it funny because I can look at my statistics and see how many people have actually watched the whole video. And I could see my statistics because I've been watching it all day because I'm curious about these people right before 
they commented and right after where I know they didn't watch the video. They just saw the title and they didn't watch the video. And something happened today that never happened. So the very first comment was calling me a communist, which was interesting. And it was the first comment was right when the video went up. So I could see he didn't watch it. So I commented and was like, what exactly did I say that made you think I was a communist? And it might be nice if you watch the video. I expected some trolley comment in return or to be ignored. I got the shock of my life. This guy came back and apologized. He came back and apologized and said, okay, I just watched the video. I, I apologize for my last comment and, you know, had some good things to say. And that freaking never happens on YouTube. So restored my faith in humanity. And I said to him, listen, when you saw the thumbnail and the title, I don't blame you for rushing to judgment. Most pink haired women are ultra left, you know, man hating lefties. So I get it, but not all of us are. So maybe, you know, next time. <laughs> oh, I asked him after the communist comment, I go, I didn't know laissez-faire capitalists were now communists, but hey, you know, I learned something new every day. So uh, please check it out. It's actually gotten for me quite a quite a lot of views on the first on the first day. Nothing compared to most YouTubers, but you know I'm still a fairly new channel and just started doing regular uploads. But uploads, but I had a really good time with it. So enough with pimping my prior work. Let's get to today's topic. So the question, and and we kind of dealt with this last episode a little bit where I had asked, where did liber libertarian, um, well, actually I said the libertarian party, and that's the best way to put it, rather than where did libertarianism come from? We'll expand on that a bit, but where did the libertarian party originate from? I'm not talking about where we are now. We're not talking about where any one of us may have come from. But the party itself, the founders, like what was the soil that it sprang up from? And this isn't even without a question. They sprang up from the right. It's not even debatable. Now, the whole reason I decided to even do this and take this route was there was a thread on my Facebook page in which I was noting my opposition to some of the things that our former party chair had done because he told me that it was his intent to steer the party left. And I had a problem with that. I'd have an equal problem with steering the party right. I think part of the problem we have as a party is our own identity. We're constantly comparing ourselves to one side or the other when, in my opinion, we're completely orthogonal to both the left and the right. And we need to stop comparing ourselves to either of those two. It will always be an imperfect comparison. And then it also gives people the wrong impression that we're centrist somehow, especially that god awful graphic. I should have pulled it up here, but you all will know what I mean. Uh, it may be somebody can give me a quick link to it, I can pull it up. But it's that one where it says um, common sense on all the issues. And it has, you know, a bunch of things that the the left agrees with, so like in two columns, and then a bunch of stuff the right agrees with in two columns. And then there's like this circle that, that encompasses half of the left and half of the right and says, this is where we are. No, it's not. And plus, the left and right don't believe half the shit they say they believe. But we need to stop pretending like we're centrist, because that's exactly what, with it being in the center. And our ideas are radical. Do I think they work? Yes. Do I think the majority of the population would consider them common sense? Absolutely not. And that word is used so often when people are looking to uh, take away our rights. I mean, how often do you hear common sense gun control. No, we need to worry about being libertarian, not this is what happens when we have the Republican as president, we go left. When we have a Democrat as president, we go right. 
So this leftward turn, okay, I don't like it. But in 2008, we were swinging far right when we, when we nominated Bob Barr and Wayne Allen Root. So it's cyclical. We get whiplash going from one to the other. And I'm just like, why can't we just be fucking libertarian? What a novel idea. We need to stop that. We need to just absolutely stop it. And if you see me looking down, it's because I'm, I'm old, okay? <laughs> As some of the commenters on the Tucker Carlson video would love to remind me, these, these kids in their basement going, eh, eh, you, you're of a certain age. Yeah, I am. And hopefully you'll be as bold as I am when you're my age. So, uh, yeah, so if I'm looking down, it's because I'm old and my eyes aren't so great to see on the screen. My big screen I have in front of me doesn't work. So I'm looking down on my laptop here. Yeah, that's exactly it, David Davis. Let me see. I'm going to try to remember how to put comments up on the screen. Oh, and I see Angela's here. Yay, Angela, I'll be getting back to your um, private message after the show. I read it right before the show. So yeah, David Davis is exactly correct. Most of the original members were disgruntled Nixon supporters. And the abolition of the gold standard, that really pissed people off. And the Vietnam War. So that's where they came from. There was a big split in a group called Young Americans for, not YAL, Young Americans for Freedom, YAF. And part of that split resulted in the people that formed the Libertarian Party. Now, in saying that, not all of the founders came from the right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the name. Was it, was Carl Bray around in the beginning? There was someone around in the beginning who was left, you know, a very prominent person and, and the name's kind of, again, I'm old. Okay. So it wasn't all of them, but it was indeed most of them. And it was certainly the Colorado crowd. They all came from the right. So. And some of the comments that I don't get to now, I will eventually get to because I so appreciate you guys being here that as long as it's on topic, I get to all comments. Absolutely. So when I was complaining about what our former chair did, even though he denies that he told me that he did, my husband was sitting right there in the conversation. He only heard my end of it because we were on the phone, but from my end, you could hear what was going on on the other side because I flipped the hell out, as you can imagine. So in comments, then, um, a, a good friend of mine, Richard Fast, commented, well, libertarianism came from the left. So <clears throat> those kinds of comments always get me going because... It's not, it's not false, but it's also not true. And I know that sounds like doublespeak. The thing, the way I can say that is because the word libertarian is very broad. And I almost wish, as much as I love the term and love the name of our party, that we didn't call our party that. Because we did co-opt the term. People can complain about that all they want, just like some people will complain that gay people co-opted the word gay, right? It's like, get over it. That's what gay means now, okay? You can walk around saying you're gay and expect everyone to think that means you're happy and then bitch that they don't. That's your problem, okay? Language changes deal with it. So we did co-opt a term um, from European libertarianism. European libertarianism not only came from the left, it remained in the left. European libertarianism, a lot of it was ANCOM, anarchist communism, or socialism. So to that extent, Richard was right. That kind of libertarianism came from the left and it never left the left. It, it's remained a branch of the left. American libertarianism, as exemplified by the Libertarian Party, came from the right. And it didn't stay there. See, that's the big difference. 
So I'm not trying to make the argument that we're a right-wing party, not at all. Unlike the European libertarians who stayed in the left. And what, though, really is the difference? Since we allegedly hold a lot of things in common, the difference is property rights, is our definition of property rights. And that's a non-negotiable. I know some people today want to say it's not. It's a non-negotiable. I've done a lot of, this is probably be Facebook live streams, going through how that is absolutely non-negotiable. I went back to our first platform statement of principles and carried it forward. I can do that again if anyone would find that useful. It's not really a live debate right now. That was kind of something that Mike Shipley was pushing and he has left the party. And if he, I love Mike. He had a heart of gold. He could be abrasive. He had a heart of gold. But if he truly doesn't believe in the definition of property rights that the Libertarian Party believes in, then it probably is best that he left because it's foundational. I don't like to see anyone leave, but if they don't believe what we believe anymore, then I wish them Godspeed, right? So we retained our solid belief in capitalism. Some people would prefer to call it free market. Fine. I think it's a distinction without a difference. I don't get into that argument. It doesn't bother me. Um, we retained our belief in capitalism, which the early party did use. It was in the statement, in the original statement of principles and um, kept property rights. But we discarded our, when I say our, I mean the founders, origins in right-wing social stuff. That's how we moved left to that extent. And that's where we're at now. We, um, we, we've completely retained our right-wing views, if you want to call it right, I don't like that, on property. And adopted what most people would consider left-wing views on social issues. But I don't consider them right and left. What we are is radical classical liberals. We've gone further than classical liberals, but the thing we're closest to is classical liberalism. And the two old parties still claim to maintain some aspects of class classical liberalism. And that's the only thing in common that we have. And, we, and the reason we took my theory, I can't prove this yet. The reason I believe we took classical liberalism further is because plain classical liberalism will always devolve into what you see now with the two old parties we have because there's no breaks. So classical liberalism starts by conceding some force. They start by conceding, well, there are certain public goods that have to be force funded, like roads and schools. Those are the two very common classical liberal things. Once you've conceded that argument, it erodes. Well, then this, then this, then this. We put the brakes on all of that and said, we don't believe in any force. So we put up a hedge. We put some brakes on this, on this buggy that classical liberalism doesn't have. Classical liberalism within itself houses the seeds of its own destruction. So that's my particular political theory right there. Let me take a look at some of the comments here. Um, liberty, into, I don't know, I have to take a look at that Liberty, um, Liberty uh, into International. Ethan, the, there, go back, but I'll, I'll summarize it here. Go back in um, my episode for January, 1972, um, where they were talking about what they were going to name the party. So even though the formation committee was called a committee to organize a libertarian party, not the libertarian party, they knew they wanted to be libertarian in the sense of like, they were mostly objectivists in the sense of like Ayn Rand, Murray Rothbard at that time. They did a poll and the, and the name Liberty Party 
came out ahead at first, and then Libertarian Party took over. And there were some other options in there, I think, like the Individualist Party or something like that. I almost wish we kept Liberty Party. Though today, that word's kind of been eroded beyond all meaning. But it wasn't a given that we were going to be called the Libertarian Party. And the reason why sometimes I regret it is because we did co-opt a term. And it confuses people. Because you'll have some socialists who will come in and people who don't know the history of the word libertarian, they get really twisted in a pretzel when, um, you know, they'll, they'll do that thing. Okay. There's that meme going around, which is, which is, which is really silly. The, the meme goes around and goes, oh, you're a libertarian socialist? Well, I'm a banana octopus. And people think that's so clever. The fact is, if you were in Europe, you could be a libertarian socialist. So when some, so when a, a socialist comes in and, and makes that kind of claim, and somebody who, we're so arrogant in America that we think we're the only, we're so ignorant of the world, like we're the only things that exist. And then they put up that dumb meme, and someone like me has to come along and go, you know, they're not wrong. It depends on what tradition you are talking about. Because what is force, right? You could go, well, no, but if we can't have property, that's force. No, property depends upon a pre-existing, I mean, a force depends upon a pre-existing theory of property rights. They're two sides of the same coin. You can't know what you can't aggress against until you know what you own. So... We'll have to, we could get into that philosophical discussion um, if you like, but they're two sides of the same coin. In their paradigm, they're not committing force because they have a different definition of property rights. Then it comes down to which one makes the most sense and which one is in more accord with our own self-ownership. And obviously, I think it's the American version. Otherwise, I'd be an ANCOM. Because I'm absolutely convinced of anarchism, and then it would be just a matter of what kind, right? So, that long introduction. Last episode, we found where, um, actually it was uh, not last one, not the April episode, the March episode, in Bits and Pieces, which was at the end of LP News, which they put at the end for a while. And that's one of the best sections, actually. They mentioned that the, the committee to form a libertarian party was mentioned in a Denver-based publication. And I went on a books and ordered, oh, I drank that soda too fast, excuse me. Ah, I feel like I got a burp. So I went on a books and I found the publication and I got it in. So that's what is going to be our foundation for this discussion. So let me see here if I can figure out how to get this up on screen. So let's hide the comment widget there for a second. Nope, didn't want that. There we go. We hid the comment widget. And up right there. No, let me figure this out. Just give me, did I not program that? There we go. One sec, I guess I did not program that in. Let's go here. Hmm. Don't know why that didn't work. That is disappointing. Well, I'll have to just pull it up from my desktop because that's where I have it. One second. I've got some uh, graphics here. So, This is, so you guys can see it clearer, this is the book that I got in. So you can see it's a 1972 edition, 495 hard copy, 250 paperback. I guess I got the paperback version. I didn't even know there was a hard, I would have loved to have gotten the hard copy. $4.95 for 1972 was a lot of money though, wasn't it? I, I would think so. So um, key influences in the American right. Um, Fernandand Sol uh, V. Solara, 
first I read that as a court case because I was so used to reading court cases. I read it as Ferdinand versus Solera, but you know, that's his middle initial. And the David Nolan was very proud that we were mentioned in this book. He didn't throw a hissy fit saying, no, we're not part of the American right. So I want to also show you guys, this is, let me uh, hide that one. This is just a little bit of the inside. I just wanted to show y'all. So this came out of Denver. I've never, Halifax Press, I've never heard of them. Copyright 1972. And there was a 1971 version of this. It's in the thumbnail for this live stream. I might pick that up too as well, just to get a feel for the history of the time, but I don't see any further ones. So I think 72 might be the last year this was published. I'm not sure about that, but I couldn't find any used or any images on Google images. So we're going to get into what it says, but I wanted to let it speak for itself a bit. And I did not screenshot or uh, photograph these things, but want to talk about like the criteria and the introduction that they used for their determination of what was right wing and what wasn't right wing. So let's see what indeed it says here. One second. Okay. It says, first and, first and most important, it is necessary to understand what is meant by the terms right and rightist and right wing. These terms are not used in any pejorative sense. Rather, they refer to a position on a political spectrum ranging from absolute totalitarianism, complete government control of all facets of human endeavor, and um, to absolute anarchy, complete absence of government in every form. In American political thought, anarchism is considered very, very far right. In Europe, it's not. It's the opposite. That's why you'll see so many contradictory political charts. Hey, Julian. Uh, Michael Wilson, uh, the name of the book is, it's a little booklet. Key Influences in the American Right, 1972. It came out right in the beginning of 72. Actually, probably January, because it came out right before the Libertarian Party officially formed. Okay. So, in terms of their philosophical basis, the extreme left position represents the philosophy of total collectivism. The state is all, the individual is nothing while the extreme right represents absolute individualism, sometimes called atomism. Uh, the individual is everything. The state is nothing. So now you can see why they classified the Libertarian Party as being on the right. Today's right is not the same as the right of then, or at least not that definition, because today's right is, uh, I don't know what they are. All right, so they say, while neither extreme has ever been realized in any major human civilization, it's possible to illustrate the dimensions of the spectrum by establishing reference points around the way. So they scaled some historical um, or and fictional types of governments to, to let you know what they thought. So for a scale of zero, meaning far, far left, they would put the government uh, typified in the, in the book 1984. And they called that omniarchy, which was, that's a neat term. And they classified as one, again, remember this is 1972 and they've gotten better, um, the current system in red China. And China's actually gotten better. They've embraced some free market principles. Um, two, they had as the current system in Soviet Russia. Again, that has gotten better. So let's go more towards the other end. Um, 
Position six, they put as the average position of the Republican Party. And position five, they put as the average position of the Democrat Party, showing they weren't that far apart. Interesting. So position seven be the position advocated by the National Review, Young Americans for Freedom, and other moderate conservative groups. Position eight would be the United States prior to 1913. Position nine would be objectivist, objectivism. And then 10 would be the anarcho-capitalist system advocated by people such as Marie Rothbard. So you're kind of getting the way they scaled here. Okay. So if they go on to say that the groups in here, virtually all of them favor a return to laissez-faire economic system or something close to it. Government regulation and taxation, all everyone in this group would agree, should be greatly reduced or eliminated. And it, it continues, it says foreign policy can vary. Um, all are strongly opposed to communism, but some favor isolationism and others favor confronting communism. It says in the area of race, race relations, most are strongly opposed to government enforced integration. And this is, but I like what they say here. This is not due to a racist motivation as these groups also oppose government enforced segregation. Their opposition is to government coercion. And that is a very good way to put it. And it said there are one or two that are white supremacists in their views, but these are the minority. It says most of them are opposed to the draft. Most are interesting. In this booklet, most are opposed to the legalization of marijuana and abortion, although some favor these moves. Obviously, the LP or the beginnings of the LP were ones that favored that. It says practically all of them favor repeal of statues prohibiting ownership of gold because gold was a big thing back then. So it's interesting. They say most are opposed to gun control laws. Okay, that's to be expected, but many favor crackdowns on pornography. So you can see the real social conservatism of the right at that time. And that's where the LP radically departed from that. So how we chose groups for inclusion, it says. It says, first, we limited ourselves to groups that were oriented towards changing the American political system. Okay. Um, political system. So it, it, they said groups that weren't political in nature weren't included. And only organizations and publications whose intent is to be national in scope. And they eliminated groups of interest only to a very small segment of the population. For example, the Latvian American Committee to do this or that, they said, or groups of fleeting temporal duration, one-shot groups that come and go. And they said, we have, no, with one or two exceptions, we have not covered those supposedly right-wing groups, which are actually total, totalitarian groups, or groups whose main thrust was anti-Negro, that's the term used at that time, which so we would say anti-African-American, anti-Semitic or paramilitary. So that says, um, basically, I'm giving you a broad overview. You'd actually have to read the thing yourself, but that gives you an idea of what they decided to include. And then they, they, they sent out responses, I guess. I, I, I mean, they sent out surveys, I guess, to these um, various groups. And it says the responses varied widely in terms of their completeness. Some groups returned some the questionnaire and material of their own. I bet you the LP sent a lot of material. And some just returned the questionnaire. Okay. So it's interesting to note that when asked 
to indicate which of the nine words most accurately describe their group's orientation. I haven't read the part on the Libertarian Party yet. Maybe there'll be something in here that'll contradict what I've laid down as my thesis, but I don't think so. All correspondents chose one of the four categories, anti-communist, conservative, constitutionalist or libertarian. So let's see which ones, obviously the libertarian one, they'd pick libertarian, but let's see if they picked any of these others. And choosing other words to describe their group, a large number chose these same four categories as well, but the largest single secondary designation was free, enter free enterprise, followed closely by individualist. Practically no groups chose the words fundamentalist, nationalist, or segregationist. And then it gives some definitions of these words. So let me look at the ones where I think probably the LP picked. Individualist, oriented primarily toward protection of life, liberty, and property of the individual, as opposed to the well-being of the state or nation. That pretty... That, that says the LP pretty closely, I think. Libertarian, similar to individualist above, I like this, with somewhat stronger emphasis on protecting the rights of others as well as your own. That is a really good way to describe libertarianism. Because sometimes people, I think, make the overemphasis on just your own rights. And I think... For however much I disagree with our former chair quite a bit, he posted something the other day that said, I'm paraphrasing, um, don't tread on me is kind of like baby libertarianism and mature libertarianism is don't tread on anyone. And I agree with him there. And that's what this is expressing. Okay, um, so I'm going to read some comments so we, that I don't get past them. Now, where I flipped them somewhere, obviously. So let me see where I... Let's go here. One second. Put the widget back up if I can. Nope, it's not... Yeah, well, here we go. Ah, but because I had it down, it's not showing the past comments. Damn it. All right, that didn't work, so... Sorry, I got to look around some things sometimes for my screen. Let me pull up the other one that I can see. Window comments. Here we go. Because I want to put some up on the screen. So Michael Morrison had a good observation here. Today's right is drug laws and censorship and often the desire to make the Bible law, especially from the Constitution Party. We were going to do something on the Constitution Party one day. Boy, their platform is a trip. And also close borders and strict anti-abortion laws. And from what we read, seemed like that was really what a lot of the right parties thought too. And that's where the LP departed. That's how we didn't stay in that soil. Because they were still favoring all that back then. So it's not that, it's not that new. Okay, let's, uh, there was, there was a few other comments, I think, that came after that. Yeah, Ethan. So Ethan says, I appreciate their obsession with gold as a kind of outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual um, grace. They weren't perfect in all areas, but we're on the right track. Absolutely agree. And everyone congratulate Ethan. He was just ordained as a deacon. And that was such a beautiful um, ceremony, Ethan. I don't know. Um, I forgot, to be honest with you, um, what the title is of the, the spiritual leader, that lady that was doing the service at at your church, but she was wonderful. I really, really enjoyed here, uh, her. Like she was uh, very inspirational. And that story she gave of that lady who like was holding a grudge against her eye. So boy, I related to that one. I related to that one all the time. In small groups with women, I always say something that gets one of them mad at me and they'll never forgive me. Um. <laughs> okay, so. Heroes and villains. Let me see if there's anything interesting here. No. So, uh, preface. So, 
they talked about their 1971 edition. And they said the major development that they've seen in the American right between 1971 and 1972, and this tracks with the LP, um, was a turning away from the Nixon administration. It says most rightists were never dyed in the world Nixon enthusiasts, but the majority supported him in 1968 and remained fairly uncritical through 1969 and 1970. But by the end of 1971, practically every rightist organization and publication had turned against the president. The three straws that broke the camel's back were the proposed family assistance plan. I have no idea what that is. We're going to have to look that up. The president's overtures to Red China and his imposition of wage and price controls, which someone had mentioned in chat earlier. So let's see if there was anything else of interest to us in here. Oh, there's something here. Let's see. The only fly in the ointment. This is interesting because this is going to, um, it's going to get into the, the birchers, which that's another thing a lot of people today don't like to admit. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't know why, but the reason I don't know why is primarily ignorance. I do not know a lot about the John Birch Society. All I know is people today in the Libertarian Party like are at pains to say we don't agree with them. I don't know anything about it, to be honest with you. All I know is that the early party did not distance themselves the way we do today. So I don't know if something changed or whether that's just an example of us not knowing our history, <clears throat> I don't know. So please understand if they did something terrible, like in the 80s or something, I'm completely ignorant. I don't want it to seem like I'm like okay with something I'm not. So it says the only flying the ointment for the Buckleyites, which is National Review, was the Nixon problem. Having hitched their wagon to Nixon Star back in 68, they found themselves in an embarrassing situation when the president moved abruptly leftward in 1971. So that is interesting. Oh, and thank you, David. I'll, I'll take a look at that and hopefully everyone else will as well. So at the time of this volume, the National Review crowd had suspended support of the Nixon administration, but, have not, but had not yet come out in opposition to his renomination or reelection says, for the John Birch Society, 1971 was a quiet year. As Nixon's treachery became evident, the Birchers' reaction was a smug, we told you so. And then they talk about something called Liberty Lobby. Does anyone know what that is? That's a new term to me. Maybe Wikipedia has something on it. Well... They just assume we would know because they just start talking about them without introducing them. It says, for Liberty Lobby, 1971 was a year of unmitigated disaster. The organization's image was badly tarnished by National Review's stunning attack in their September 10th issue. Might have to get that issue of National Review. The organization's claim to being the only effective Washington-based lobby for conservatives, okay, so that's what they were, was seriously undermined by the American Conservative Union, which Liberty Lobby claims stole their mailing list. So, apparently Liberty Lobby felt Liberty Lobby. <laughs> I bet you a lot of people did that at that time. Uh, fell apart. And then it says Liberty Lobby's decline was more than matched by the gains realized by the four year old libertarian movement. Okay, that is interesting. Libertarian publications and groups sprung up like weeds. That there were over a hundred libertarian newsletters at this time. A graphic symbol called the liver sign, we know what that was, began appearing. And in September, plans were announced for the formation of a libertarian political party. Okay, we'll like this right here. 
Libertarianism, it should be noted, is quite different from conservatism as a political, economic, and social philosophy. Here we go. Libertarians, not where they came from, but what they consider themselves now, libertarians do not, generally speaking, consider themselves as right-wingers. True. In the sense that William Buckley or Robert Welch are. Instead, they claim libertarianism transcends the traditional left-right spectrum, offering a combination of the civil liberties usually associated with the left and the economic liberties advocated by the right. This idea was present in the graphic form in the in graphic form in the January 1972 issue of The Individualist, the magazine of the Society for Individual Liberty. I believe I have that issue. But I wish they put what this graphic is. I wish I uh, photographed it. I'm going to hold it up to the screen so you guys could see it. The libertarians claim to be the wave of the future stretches credibility. Since libertarianism is a minor element within a con conglomeration of viewpoints. It says the most probable likelihood for the libertarian movement, they were a prophet, um, is that it will continue to exist approximately in its present state, a loose complex of individuals and organizations with certain basic attitudes and commons, but divided by numerous disagreements on specific goals, strategies, and tactics. And here we are 50 years later. This dude was a prophet. They didn't, they didn't put, they didn't put a name on this. Check this out. There's a footnote. A guide to the chaotic libertarian movement is available for $2 from an outfit called Mega. And then they didn't say what the name of this was. I'm going to have to do a search on this. I would love to find that. And Mega also publishes a monthly report on libertarian activity activities under the name A is A. I have some of those um, newsletters. Okay, let me see if I can hold this up. It's a very confusing chart. I, 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 my eyes are crossing looking at it and I should know what I'm looking at. So this is what was in the individualist. Let me see. That's pretty confusing, right? But you can see it's the old way the political spectrum was. Instead of a diamond, it goes up to the left, because I'm showing you guys backwards, with um, objectivism being and anarcho-capitalism being at the tippy top. And you could see the, um, the Liber sign is following the same trajectory. That's why the Liber sign used to be slanted like that. And just the fun fact for those of you who care, this is why if you recognize this, not just from our convention, but the Radical Caucus's current logo is this, but upward because that's the way it would be represented now with the Nolan chart now being a diamond. So that's where the Radical Caucus got their logo. So at the bottom, I'm going to have to start using this word. You got that omnarchy or omniarchy. And up at the top, you have anarchy. So uh, total government, no government. I want to see what they got. Do they have the political? They don't have the Republican and Democrat parties on here. Because I would like to see where they put them on here. But they put Nixon right there. Anyone else that was a big figure? Wallace, who was running right there. Okay. Let's flip the page. All right, so that was it in the introductory material. Um, again, if you guys find this interesting, which, which I do, 
Um, I'm probably going to read the whole thing. I, w I would like to get, not, not out loud here, because I'd like to get a, an idea of the sorts of movements that were going on at the time. And if I end up finding more interesting stuff, I'm going to do that as a supplement to my patrons. I don't know if I will, but I'd already promised them that book type things are going to be patron only for, for a while at least. Okay, let's take a look here at the comments. Okay, now I'm going to put some of these on the screen because they're significant. Not that anyone's comments are insignificant, but I think they would be of interest to everybody. Michael Morrison is telling us something about the uh, John Birch Society was originally merely anti-communist. Okay, so basically the media is pulling what it pulls. That anyone who isn't on board with their narrative is a bigot of some kind. But how come so many people in the Libertarian Party seem to be on board with that? Because really, mention the John Birch Society and people freak the hell out. Is it just the self-hating libertarianism that I, you know, we're, we're sometimes, we're really strange. Mark Montoni calls it wet bladder libertarianism or wet bladder syndrome that we'd rather piss ourselves rather than saying a truly libertarian thing. Let's see here. Let's put up more. Here's another comment. You guys are my researchers. So Liberty Lobby is a conservative organization that you would hear on shortwave radio and conservative talk radio. Are they still around? Or did what happened in the 70s kill them off? And let's see what else we've got. There's a few other pretty intensive comments here. Michael Morrison. I'm not sure what issue are you talking about. Um, not sure what, 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 oh, A is A. Um, is there only a single issue? Because if there is, then I have it because I have an A, I know I have an A is A. I've been plundering eBay and Ava books and stuff, buying a bunch of things for my historical research. And A is A is one of the things that I picked up. Okay, so that's it so far for comments. Now we're going to go to the actual entry, which I have not read. I was saving it for you guys for the Libertarian Party. So let me get that up on screen. Okay. And I've got to find it in the book here so I can read it. It's under committee. I was looking under Libertarian. Okay, committee to organize a libertarian. How can I get <laughs> over here? Because <laughs> I don't know how to move me around yet. I didn't figure out how to how to work the program that way yet. Though I did get, you can see, I got a fancy other camera. Hey, <laughs> but I'm back here. Okay, that is David Nolan's address up top there. We talked about that before. A description. Ad hoc group organized to establish a libertarian political party. Chairman David F. Nolan. He was the chairman of the committee. He wasn't the first chairman of the party. His wife, Susan Nolan, was. And I told the story in another episode about how I tracked her down. She's still in Denver. Unfortunately, she has Alzheimer's. Uh, Vice Chairman Pip Boyles. He also was the chair of the first platform committee. Primary. Okay, these are the words they talked about where they got to pick. So primary designation, libertarian. We knew that would be. Secondary designation, the two I thought they would pick, free, enterprise, and individualist. Classification, political, position index, eight and a half. I think that must be that chart we were looking at in the beginning. So they put it just at the time that they were looking um, slightly less towards the extreme than objectivism. I'm not sure I'd agree with that, though. 
but very little was out at that time. So probably looking at their initial material, like the temporary platform, because temporary platform was a little weak sauce. Um, yeah. And, and I have whole episodes on the temporary platform, by the way. Okay. By the time this book is published, the committee to organize a libertarian party will be defunct. In its place, there will be a fledgling political party of a few hundred members operating under the name Libertarian Party. Annual dues for membership in the party have already been announced, $4 for students, $6 for non-students. According to the material issued by the committee, the new party will serve as the political arm of the libertarian movement, enabling libertarians to take advantage of the opportunities for public for publicity available to political candidates and providing a permanent organizational home for politically inclined libertarians. Notice what's not there. Just, I'm throwing that question out there. You guys tell me what's not there. The new party will hold a national convention in the spring or early summer of 1972 to choose its nominees for the presidency and vice presidency and to formulate a platform. The people it is considering as possible nominees range from Representatives Philip N. Crane, Republican Illinois, and H.R. Gross, Republican Iowa, to Murray Rothbard and Carl Hess. Carl Hess is the name I was trying to think of, not Bray. Wasn't it Hess? Is it Hess that was came from the left? I'm getting confusing myself now. Maybe somebody in chat will know. Its temporary platform calls for abolition of the draft, legalization of gold ownership, and immediate withdrawal from Vietnam and the United Nations, among other things. All righty. So very little was known at that time. They answered a survey to, well, this way, to include themselves in a book that put them with the American right while distinguishing that libertarianism was different, but that's where it came from. Um, so I think that was pretty enlightening. And out of the establishment people that they might have considered for a candidate, it was two Republicans at the time. All righty. So I, I hope you guys like enjoyed this. I've got a bunch of little books like this. There's also one called, um, the 1972 Libertarian Handbook. I wonder if that's the one that was put by Mega. Is that what I was referencing? I'll have to go look who published that. I don't think so, though, because it's about as big as this. And I got the impression from that footnote we were dealing with something smaller. But I, but I could be wrong. All right. Let me get this off the screen so I can move my booty back to the center. Yes. <laughs> I'll figure out at one point where I don't have to scoot around. This is very low tech, right? But in here, we got to take advantage of my other camera. So you like my rooster? <laughs> I, I I had to have it. When I saw it in the store, I was like, oh, I'm waiting. I got to buy it. He's like, wait till it goes on clearance. I'm like, that will never go on clearance. It's too cool. A, um, It'll sell out. And it did. So I'm glad I got it. I got my little lady Liberty down in the basement. So it's just a view of the window. Well, but you know, why not? I did get the paint this corner of the basement pink. So that was nice. Okay. Everyone got to play with my little camera. That's it for today. I, unless I run across something else, the next historical um, show will be May, 1972. And I hope to do that this coming week because as you know, or maybe you don't, people who weren't here for some past ones may not know. My original goal was to do one a month and really spend the whole month talking about the corresponding month from 50 years ago. But with COVID and everything that happened with the brouhaha with our conventions, I fell behind. Secretary got a lot of work to do around convention time. So I want to catch up to whatever month we're in. So if I get all the way up to November and November, great. Otherwise I'll catch up in December, but I'm going to try to do one of these a week until we're caught up and then we'll do the one a month and really get into it a lot more. 
but I can't pass up when I find little tidbits like this. All right. I hope you guys have an awesome night. As usual, you got to, well, you don't have to, you could always just take off, but please, I asked for your forbearance for one minute, two minutes for me to ask if you are enjoying this and the research and the time I'm putting into it to please consider becoming a patron of the show at patreon.com. Search for Pink Flame of Liberty. I truly appreciate it. And there will soon be content that will be patron only, at least for some time. I don't like keeping things behind a paywall permanently, but they may, I got to give my patrons an extra value. So there will be things that will be at least advanced released there. So, you know, trying to give them a little bit, a little bit of, of a, of a value for supporting. Um, also, if you can't do that, completely understand if you could, um, like, and share my videos, that would be great because once I get a certain number of viewer hours, then I qualify for YouTube monetization. Lastly, and this would help me a great deal in the show notes, there's an Amazon link. It doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you something about the Amazon affiliate program. It doesn't matter what the link is to though. Go check out the link because it's good. But if you are buying something from Amazon, just start from that product link that's in my show notes and anything you buy in that same session, because, you know, Amazon keeps a cookie on your computer, gets credited to my affiliate account and it doesn't cost you a damn thing. And the things I, anything I earn from the Amazon affiliate account, I reinvest into having better equipment or better programs or things like that. So, and that doesn't cost you anything. Plus get a laugh out of what I put in the link. Hopefully that link still works because I haven't mentioned it in a while. I completely forgot. And um, also I believe my wish list is down there. Also is my address in case you want to send me a ham. Um, people have, well, one person has sent me a ham in the past and it was greatly appreciated. All right, everyone, you have an awesome night. And let me see if I can figure out what my little thingy here, if I can figure out how to do the closing.